Hello, everyone. I am Bob Lingle of Off the Beaten Path Bookstore um, in Lakewood, New York. I'm here tonight with Tano Bilt Biltstead. Um, Tano is a has been a cab driver, a squatter on the Lower East, east Side of Manhattan, mediator and facilitator, and rustabout construction worker. His fiction has been published in Rosebud Magazine and Mondays Are Murder um, series. For some reason, I can't read. And his nonfiction has been published in World War III Illustrated and Perspectives on Anarchist Theory. He holds a master's degree in international relations. Um, before we get started, I wanted to thank um, Tano, um, Felicia, and Lanternfish Press for putting this event together. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. Oh, I'm so pleased to be here, Bob. Uh, it was great to see uh, the little intro that you did. It was a wonderful little like video intro with the, uh, um, the picture of the boat and everything. It was really lovely. Thanks for putting this all together. I'm excited to be here with you today. You're welcome. I um, always have fun putting those together. It's amazing what you can do with stock footage and stock music. Stacy Flood from uh, another Lantern Fish Press author was surprised, a little disappointed, but still loved the video. But he uh -huh. thought that I gathered somebody and put them on a train to, to shoot the promo video for his. So uh -huh. I assure you, I did not find a old ship <laughs> to set sail, although we are very close to a lake. Mm, uh, lovely. <laughs> so working with um, Lantern Fish Press for a lot of our virtual author events, um, I was initially approached approached about Stacy Flood's book, um, but then I had the pick of the litter. They said, go through our list and find other authors that you might want to talk to. And not knowing anything about your book, The Anatomist Tale, um, I read through your author bio like I just uh, read aloud here. And I found it very fascinating. You, you have quite the colorful um, background, and I um, hope you're you're open to talking about that a little bit. Oh yeah, of course, definitely. It's a whole other aspect of my life that's you know not my writing life, but it, it's public, and yeah, it's it's definitely a piece of it. Um, and in ways, it relates to the book as well, um, because so my background. I, I, my family immigrated to the United States, actually to the Lower East Side uh, in 1985. We were immigrants from, Den my father was Danish, my mom was Canadian, we lived in Canada for a while, and then Denmark. And then we came to New York in the early mid 80s. And a few years after, when I was like kind of um, late teens or whatever, there was a whole squatting scene in the Lower East Side. Um, and I got involved with that. Um, and, you know, basically ended up living in a couple of different buildings and then have kind of lived in the same place, the same building, which was a, you know, totally abandoned building with a very interesting history, uh, kind of before it was abandoned. And a group of people took over this building uh, and I moved in a few years later and we've been working on it, you know, kind of ever since uh, we went through a legalization process in the mid 2000s. And uh, I moved in in about 93, uh, and we mm -hmm. went through a legalization process in the mid 2000s. And, uh, you know, now are sort of in this community building together. It's a limited equity co-op, uh, which means it's, you know, affordable for working people into the future. Um, for the next 40 years, actually, we have a deal with the city. Um, and yeah, it was a very, you know, so I lived in this neighborhood, uh, the Lower East Side East Village, um, which has since become like a, you know, a brunch, uh, you know, 20 year olds uh, out for brunch and high heels kind of neighborhood. Uh, but at the time uh, it was real, it was real rough and crazy and creative and wild. Um, and, you know, yeah, that was kind of like where I, I came up. 
and and sort of cut my teeth. And in a way, it relates to the book in a way. Like part of my curiosity has been, you know, how people do things themselves, mm -hmm. create their own environments, um, and also this kind of like outlawry or um, and and piracy. You know, essentially this like what happens when people you know have the ability to sort of make their own rules uh, in community with each other mm -hmm. and in some common enterprise. Um, and you know that's kind of informed not so much like that my own experience you know the book is really informed by a lot of research and stuff like that but but my curiosity and interest is in ways you know sort of overlaps you know or or sort of radiates out from my own life uh into the work that was uh you know went into the book basically and then your experience as a mediator and facilitator um how has that really evolved especially in the, in the past year when People yeah, that. that's interesting. So my my journey, and in ways it sort of overlaps, my, my journey to doing sort of mediation and facilitation work was actually, again, centered around this curiosity of, of how people can make decisions together and work things out between each other without some outside authority um, or judicial system or whatever. And actually I had a, I have a background as a social worker. Um, mm -hmm. I'm actually, I didn't, I don't have an MSW, but I worked as a social worker working with homeless youth, um, for a period of time. And then I also worked with, uh, survivors of labor and sex trafficking. So people who were in these like forced labor and, and um, prostitution kind of situations, uh, I was providing counseling and case management and I became actually in the program where I was doing this uh, anti-trafficking work, uh, they had a program for a domestic violence program for men who were abusers. Mm -hmm. And it kind of was um, trying to teach them sort of skills and sort of insight into their own kind of patterns of behavior. And it was kind of a restore, well, it wasn't this restorative justice, it was a mandated program. And somehow I became more and more curious about what, what it's like it, also in serious situations for people to kind of seek justice and reparations um, mm. between each other. Um, and I started, I got trained as a mediator um, and I got trained as a facilitator, kind of like working to support groups. Um, and that's what I've been doing. You know, I have a small practice doing that. I still do some construction work actually, um, but I have a small practice doing this mediation and facilitation work that in the last year has really morphed into doing um, work with couples and families. Um, so I've been doing a lot of this facilitated dialogue work with um, with people that are in relationships with each other. Um, and then I also do some individual work with uh, mostly with men who are looking uh, to address kind of accountability issues in their, in their pasts. Um, so that's kind of like the professional side. But again, the theme is like, how do people work things out um, with each other you know, on their own, hold each other accountable, um, inquire, you know, um, be kind, you know, where necessary and curious, you know, and also set boundaries and limits and explain their experiences. That's super interesting. There is one part when you were speaking that I couldn't help get distracted because it answered a question that I've been asking myself for the last couple of weeks of, does the ice cream man still exist? Oh yeah, did you hear it? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, because where where I grew up, there was always the ice cream man that always that drove around, and now I live in a very small village, and I'm like, well, the ice cream man wouldn't come out this way because it's a very tiny village. But all right, yeah, that, that answered a question that I've been meaning to pose to somebody for the last couple of weeks. Um, the ice cream man still exists, and it's somewhere <laughs> in New York, and there's ice cream out there, definitely. It's the soft. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, that is good to know. And I, sorry that I uh, did a little sidetrack. Um, what you, everything that you're involved in is super fascinating. Is the construction, is that tied into your experience from the squatting and revitalizing? Yeah. I mean, actually that's kind of where, I mean, my, my, um, my dad was an architect and a builder. Um, not he was uh, when i say architect he didn't have his own firm or practice or anything like that he was trained in in um in europe and came over and ended up being a draftsman um you know kind of immigrant story but uh also you know had a lot of um uh experience doing construction work um and so i had a little bit of that as a kid but then as a as a as a you know 
squatter, we basically had to, we were in these buildings that were destroyed, utterly destroyed uh, by years of neglect, sometimes intentionally, fires, mm -hmm. et cetera. So we kind of had to fix them up ourselves. And that's kind of where I acquired, you know, yeah, my construction skills. I kind of do everything, mm -hmm. mostly do electrical and plumbing stuff, but, you know, also carpentry, sheetrock, uh, um, you know, modding, plastering, tiling, you name it, basically. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, um, your background was what led me to you and wanting to do this event. So I'm glad that we had, we had a chance to discuss it a bit. And it explains a bit about how um, in depth your your novel is and how diverse and um, the amount of characters and things that are involved in it. Um, what brought you into the the world of writing? How long have you been writing for? Hmm, that's a good that's a good question. Like in ways, my my um, approach to writing or or the way that I ended up writing is a little bit untraditional. Um, I mean, I've always been interested in writing. I'm a, I'm a literary person. I read a lot, um, but I don't have a lot of formal training as a writer. I have been working or meeting with a writing group now for like seven or eight years, actually. I've been meeting with a group where we meet and we share writing and we talk about it. And I've learned an immense amount there. Um, and I do, you know, I did manage to earn you know, a few degrees, mostly at city colleges or city institutions. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but I haven't really taken a lot of writing classes. Um, so it was really just a drive, a passion. I wanted to write stories. I wanted to write this novel. It was like something I just felt like I had in me. Um, and I did. And I'm, you know, continuing to write. I have a number of other projects going now, you know, it's since, since it's come out, uh, I'm working, well, I've kind of finished a collection of short stories and um, working on a, another book, um, you know, at the moment that I'm doing sort of research and writing around. So, so my path to writing was a little bit circuitous, um, mm -hmm. but it was always something that I was, you know, very interested in and practiced on my own, but I don't have a lot of formal, um, you know, MFA experience. Sure. And the, you had mentioned the research um, that you're doing now, what was the research pro process like for for this book? I really appreciated um, the amount of backstory that went into, and especially right from the beginning of the book, but then as each chapter goes along, um, it seems like you kind of build the scene and build the time period mm -hmm. um, before you even get into the plot of, of, of that chapter. Mm -hmm. um, so how much research did you, did you have to um, do for and how involved this was. <laughs> I really did an immense amount of research. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the book has a bibliography in the back, uh, which, you know, captures like a lot of, I sort of kept notes as I was, you know, working mm -hmm. on it, not really with the intention of, of publishing it with it, um, but, I mean, publishing the the bibliography with the book. Uh, it was actually Lanternfish who came up with that idea. Oh, why don't you add mm -hmm. the bibliography? Or do, you, do you know your sources? I mean, in terms of my research process, it's really a matter of curiosity. And, um, you know, at some point, uh, at some point when I was in school, um, you know, the suggestion for, you know, approaching research was like, read something that you like uh, and you find compelling, uh, find out what the sources of that writer used, you know what I mean? What was the research that, that was used in the, in, in, the, in the thing that you liked or whatever, read that, look at those sources, look at those sources, look at those sources, it's sort of like, following a train of sources and you know kind of my own curiosity uh and and sort of where it led me and then also to some extent like what the characters were calling for in terms of what did they need to know about the world um what was some background uh, what were some things about their lives that maybe i didn't know it was pretty mm -hmm. important to me to create kind of a historical space in the book um and you know i feel like like doing that through you know kind of research and sort of digging in uh to you know various aspects and actually you know i can say that since you know i've sort of completed the book i continue to learn more about that time period mm -hmm. uh, or different things going on so even though i read an immense amount about what was going on it, particularly in the atlantic world um and in the other kind of worlds that are depicted in the book um you know there's always more uh, there's always room for for more learning and more sort of insight into you know the dynamics of a particular time in in human experience. Did you um, ever find that you were getting hung up by the research? Did you while you were writing was it research first and then the story, or were you writing the story and like 
I don't know if that's true, but let me re look into that later. That's a that's a good question. I think a little bit of both. Like I think, uh, I mean, I, I never felt hung up by the research. Mm -hmm. um, I did feel maybe from maybe from my own um, lack of like sort of formal training or knowledge. Like I did feel like I want to know everything. I really want to mm -hmm. like be able to be in this space um, uh, that I'm sort of depicting in the book. So there was a lot of reading and research and, and thought, but I really enjoy it, honestly. So it didn't really feel tedious. Uh, and I wasn't on a, you know, not on a deadline or anything like that. I'm, you know, essentially writing for myself in between my life. Um, you know, this is my first book. Uh, and I hope it's not my last, uh, yeah. or it's certainly not my last in terms of writing, but, you know, I hope it's not my last in terms of publication. So, you know, I have some other stuff and, um, you know, it was an experiment in a way you, you don't really know, um, where it's going. So it's kind of like writing into the void and, um, and then engaging, engaging with the material, engaging with the writing, uh, and sort of engaging with the ideas and, 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 you know, whatever sort of came up. So it wasn't really... It was a long process, um, but it didn't. It felt very uh, organic. And um, I realized that we were getting into this conversation, and some people that are watching may have no idea what we're talking about in terms of what your book is about if they mm -hmm. haven't read it beforehand. Oh, good point. Um, we should probably do a, a bit of a recap. Um, I enjoyed um, so much. Like you, historical fiction is a huge seller in our store, but. 90% of it is World War II novels. Mm. Nothing wrong with World War II. There's a lot of stories that can come out of that time period, but it was a joy to read a historical fiction novel that was not World War II. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll let you um, do a recap of, of, of your work because- Definitely. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Um, so the book is called The Anatomist Tale and it follows a particular narrator. It's told from a first first person perspective and the narrator, you know, the, the story begins with the narrator's life in England uh, around the turn of the 17th century, or uh, sorry, the early 18th, the 17th to 18th century. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he kind of, there are elements of the narrator's story that are very typical for what's going on at the time. Well, I'll do the full recap. So essentially the narrator um, is, is his family falls apart, his rural sort of peasant family, his family falls apart, and through a series of circumstances, he ends up becoming a ship surgeon. He's trained as a surgeon, which at the time was a very different kind of occupation than it is now. A lot of surgeons were also dentists and, and stuff like that. So it was really just the cutting arts, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and he sort of ends up on this ship. Uh, which was a way to sort of uh, become, you know, a better surgeon, get some professional experience, etc. But he's never really been on the sh on, on a ship before, and this is at a time when the British Empire is expanding um, its reach or continuing to expand its reach. And on the ship, there is a, you know, the a tyrannical captain, which was, you know, sort of baked in as much as that's depicted in in um, in you know literature and stuff like that. Um, it would really happen. There was a lot of very, you know, there was the relationships of power that were in there. Um, and there's a mutiny on the ship. The mutineers decide to go pirate uh, and then have a series of adventures. In a way, it's a failed pirate venture. They, they mm -hmm. go pirate at this time when piracy is kind of ending uh, in the Caribbean because of um, uh, the expansive reach of the British Empire and, and British law. And um, they end up um, they end up in this tropical commune, basically this this space. It's it's a it's not a commune by modern standards. It's like a maroon space actually with escaped mm -hmm. slaves and Indians and and pirates. And they kind of negotiate this space together and figure out where they are. And the narrator ends up. Um, well, I won't I won't I won't I won't yeah. tell the ending exactly. Yeah. But the narrator sort of narrates this experience from the outside. He's a little bit curious. Uh, he's shocked at times doesn't quite know where his alliances and allegiances are. And uh, there's a you know pretty expansive cast of characters who are in this world. And in the beginning, um, when you were, the first chapter when you were talking about the, the family structure, um, I found it interesting just because of the experiences that, that I've had um, and now relying on, on your experience as a mediator and counselor for, for families. Mm -hmm. um, the parents kind of go one by one. I always try to avoid spoilers. <laughs> um, but after the second parent goes, I found it interesting that the 
siblings just kind of scattered. Mm -hmm. And it, I saw it as either an option of the siblings stick together or the siblings just kind of fend for themselves. Um, mm -hmm. How did you determine which way they were going to go? I guess like, so, so kind of what happens to the family without getting into all the details, but in the larger historical context, the family is a peasant family. Uh, they're kind of like tenant farmers, which is a very common structure at the time. Uh, you know, it's sort of like emerging from feudalism. And there was this thing that happened in, in, in England and in other parts of Europe, and that is still happening in, in parts of the world now called enclosure, where all this property that was considered common property um, in the sense that it wasn't really owned by anybody in particular um, was sort of privatized. And what that meant for this family and for, you know, many, many other families was that their means of, of subsistence were taken away from them because mm -hmm. families, uh, you know, all these sort of peasant families and tenant farmer families, they'd use this like property that was out there or the, this land um, to cultivate extra crops, to, uh, you know, run their, you know, cows or goats uh, for feeding and, and stuff like that. And so when it was privatized, which is something that happened over the course of like a century or two uh, in England, um, you know, it sort of like broke them apart. And so in some kind of way, you know, it was the breaking. It was like the, the social bonds were broken uh, by, you know, the traditional relationships um, with the land and the possibilities mm -hmm. of subsistence. As those were broken, the bonds of the family were also broken. Um, and I want to take this time, anyone that's watching now, if you have questions or comments, if you're watching on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, um, you can throw those comments into this um, comment section. We'll see them on our end. Um, Going into the, the themes of the book, one of the first themes that I noticed reading along was the idea of control. And you kind of hit it um, back to back of the narrator wanting to catalog all the plants and animals and the Captain um, Bellamy just kind of being super in control of over, over everything. Um, and then God um, being the ultimate power over over everything in, in that moment of the book. Mm -hmm. um, so how was that in, intentional to to explore this idea of of the man's yeah. trying to control and make sense of the world around them? Yeah, absolutely. Like one of the things that you know, in, in my sort of research and in thinking about you know what it was like for you know people on on boats, right, and sort of what happened. Um, there was somebody by the name of uh, a sociologist called Irving Goffman um, uh, wrote about total institutions, prisons, um, places like ships or you know controlled sort of labor places and the kind of dynamics that happen within these total institutions. Um, and a lot of times, you know, yes, it's like mostly it's these kind of like control and hierarchical kind of situations arise when people are in these totalized institutions. So it's it, it was the nature of the workplace for, for people who were merchant marines at the time, but also a theme of what was happening at that time in historical development. Um, I was really curious about this time in particular, which is the early 18th century, like late 17th, early 18th century, because I saw it and see it as like a time when the foundation of our modern world was kind of really being built um mm -hmm. not at the foundation it was kind of the adolescence of this world that we're in and a lot of the movement was from sort of certain forms of control to other forms of control and the new forms of control were often more direct um mm -hmm. people uh, a lot of people lost autonomy you know certainly like poor and working people lost autonomy um a lot of African people lost autonomy, a lot of indigenous people lost autonomy, you know, within this expansion of empire and, and you know, essentially control, this kind of like top-down control that became total. And this was the experience on the ship for the characters and the experience that the surgeon kind of, kind of was able to see and document in, in, in his experience. Right. Um, there's a question that came in from uh, Janine Roth, if it's true, people write what they know. This story could have been from a sailor, doctor, politician, any number of avenues. Hearing about you being a facilitator and counselor, um, so that's where the story comes from. It's fascinating. Um, did the story or idea of the story come first or your facilitating aspirations? 
Ah, oh, very, very, um, actually, that is an interesting question and an interesting observation. And I would say actually that my, the formalization of my facilitation sort of work or whatever, my training, my interest in working with groups actually came after the book. Uh, I feel like I've been in a lot of like group projects. Uh, mm -hmm. I've spent a lot of time in sort of like community projects or group projects and often been, you know, frustrated at times, inspired at other times by people's ability to kind of coordinate and cooperate with each other and get things done. Um, and the book was definitely a, a project or an exercise of that curiosity about how people get things done, you know, in their lives. Um, and, and actually my more sort of like my subsequent, you know, more formal training around facilitation actually happened well, you know, not completely after, but th definitely after I'd started the process of writing the book. So that's a really insightful question. Thank you so much. What was the timeline for you from kind of beginning the research and writing the story to, to it being published? It took, it was a, it was a long journey. It took about, um, it took about four or five years to write the book. Um, and kind of, you know, this is in between, you know, kind of working and mm -hmm. living my life in different kinds of ways. Um, so yeah, it took like four or five years to write the book, uh, and, and do all the research and everything from when I started, I was like, I'm going to write a book. I had done a, a draft with a, the voice of the narrator, you know, in some kind of way. And, and I was like, okay, I think this, I'm going to write a book about this. Um, and, and then it took another four or five years to get published. And I will say, you know, at the time, you know, I'll share with people, anybody out there who has like writing aspirations, I had given up. I was not going to get published. Mm -hmm. It was done. And I was getting to the point and I was still writing. I had other projects or whatever. And I kind of decided, well, I love to write. I love to explore the space. I like doing the research and the reading. I like thinking of characters. I like seeing what sort of comes up and emerges. I'm going to continue to do this. I'm going to continue sending it out. I'm going to continue, you know, trying to see if I can find, you know, the right person, but I'm not going to despair. This is my practice. You know, I write. Part of the practice of being a writer is sending stuff out and hoping you get published. Um, but I'm not going to get too hung up on that. And uh, one summer I was at uh, the summer of, I think, 2000, summer of 2019. I went to the Brooklyn Book Fair and Lantern Fish, who I hadn't heard of before, they had a um, they had a booth there. And I saw some of their other books and I was like, oh, this publisher seems like they're weird enough and creative enough. Uh, that maybe they might like read my book and like it. And I, I, they had an open reading period in, in October uh, of, you know, 2019. I sent in the book and, and they were, they were, uh, they, they took it up and I went through the whole editing process with them and it came out in, in May of last year. I, uh, I was really excited to um, develop this relationship with Lantern Fish Press. We've got four, potentially five events scheduled with them this Great. year. Um, and, it, we got connected through, it was a publicity speed dating thing that was set up through our regional American Bookseller Association group. And I went in and for a couple of weeks, I had this whole structure planned out of like, all right, I have 15 minutes to, to pitch to 40 or 50 different publicists. This is what I'm going to say. And then the morning that I was going to present, I got an email from our regional representative, like, these are the questions that they're going to look for. I'm like, oh. I don't know if I have that in my pitch. <laughs> so I'm only going to talk about those questions and then a few other things. So I really went in just kind of winging it. Uh -huh. And during it, I saw, um, I'm going to mess up her name again, Felicia. Felicia. Uh, uh, uh. All right. Um, I saw Felicia just nodding her head the whole time that I was speaking. I'm like, OK, I'm just going to focus on her because that's the only one that seems to be paying attention right now. <laughs> and sure enough, I got an email from her later that day to, to set up some events. So they are um, a really cool publisher. To, to I'm glad you got connected with them, and I'm glad that, that I did too. Yeah, um, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they they have a, um, a knack for finding their, their people and the, their outliers. <laughs> definitely, definitely. We're lucky. We're lucky to have them. Um, another question from Janine on the topic of publishing. Um, did you ever consider self-publishing before getting picked up? You know, um, 
Yeah, that's a really good question. And and certainly as a as a you know sort of beginning author or an author, you know, an unpublished author, it's definitely something um that it bears consideration. And I did consider it, but I'm also not like my own, I'm not a um I'm I'm like pretty good at writing, or I think I'm okay at writing, you know, kind of thing. Like I can do the writing and the research. I enjoy it. It's like my passion. Uh, but the actual, the part of like doing the the Feliz's job, the publicist, mm -hmm. and then getting yourself out there um, in that kind of way was not something like the self-publishing project is also a project of like self-promotion, essentially. Getting a book printed is one thing, getting it edited and getting a good book design, which frankly, Lanternfish did an amazing job at. Um, you know, is another thing. It's a beautiful book. It's really, mm -hmm. it, it feels great. But you know, they, they really, they really pay attention to details in terms of the book as an object. Um, and I'm so lucky to like have that. So would I have been able to? That was the part that was really um, uh, uh, intimidating in terms of considering the possibility of self-publishing. Was like putting together the whole package of what is a beautiful book, um, and also having an outside eye. Uh, so I've been in this writer's group for so long, uh, and I've really appreciated the ways that the, my, my, my comrades, my fellows in the, in the writing group are different from me. We have different aesthetics and different approaches. Um, and that's, you know, kind of really great. But also having the experience of being edited um, and getting sort of feedback from somebody on the publishing end has really been invaluable. Um, so not to speak, you know, I think the project of self-publishing is amazing. And I think the people who do it, you know, well, I'm in, you know, massive admiration, you know, sort of of them because you have to wear many hats at once. Um, but I didn't, I was intimidated to sort of take that on myself. Um, and I wanted to throw in a couple thoughts because um, we frequently have people watch these events that are aspiring writers or close to completing their, their first novels um, or um, different projects. I, one, don't discount the small press publishers. Mm -hmm. um, I have found a lot of great relationships with Lanternfish Press. Um, Steerforth Press is an, another one that we've had, a um, Biblioasis out of Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, they are so, like, not that bigger publishing houses aren't passionate about it, mm -hmm. but they are passionate about every single book that they, they have. Mm -hmm. um, where you can kind of get lost in the shovel. So if you can't get published with Penguin Random House or Simon and Schuster, don't fret. <laughs> There's a lot of other options out there. And if you decide to go um, the self-publishing route, Ingram Spark is the one that I push. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> Ingram, where obviously Amazon runs the world, mm -hmm. um, but Amazon is pretty restrictive in terms of where you can get your book in. So if mm -hmm. you want to get your book into a bookstore and you want to self-publish, Ingram Spark is the one to you want to look up. Mm. Um, I will step down from my soapbox. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that resource. Yeah, box. Yeah. <laughs> um, getting back into the the themes, the uh, one um, that is just kind of become a growing conversation in the real world um, is inequality, and you touch on it through wealth, um, gender, and and race. Mm -hmm. um, can you discuss some of the thoughts, thought process behind what you put in? Some of it was just kind of probably not as intentional as it was just natural because of what you were writing about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I really appreciate that question. Um, and yeah, I mean, obviously now we're also in this age of inequality that, that in ways, um, you know, uh, has parallels in terms of the extent of inequality of, of that time. Uh, uh, well, of the time that we're talking about in the book, but also like, you know, 100, 120 years ago when we had the oil barons and stuff in the United States, there was this vast inequality. So at the time in the book also, in this sort of early 18th century time, uh, there was a growing sort of inequality um, that was happening. And then that was kind of necessary. It was produced. Um, uh, intentionally, you know, in some ways, accidentally, just by the processes of history in other ways. Um, there was, you know, it was early, well, no, it was sort of later in the time. There's a great book out there called um, Caliban and the Witch by Silvia Federici, um, which documents how the kind of the repression of women was necessary 
um, to the process of um, early capitalism, basically. And it's sort of, she ties the witch hunts and the sort of witch scares that were happening in England and throughout the European world and the, and the colonial world at that time with you know, the need to repress and control nature uh, and sort of produce this kind of inequality and assert a patriarchy, you know, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, it was also a time the early 18th century. Now, obviously, um, I was actually just looking at Ibram Kendi's book uh, earlier today in preparation for the stamp from the beginning, which is also mm -hmm. a wonderful book. Um, uh, where he talks about, you know, the history of racist ideas. Um, and, uh, you know, the first kind of like treaties uh, in the sort of post-Enlightenment world uh, was sometime in, it was before uh, the conquest when the Portuguese um, seized some slaves in Africa. And they started being produced this idea of difference and uh, inequality, essentially this idea of a hierarchy of, uh, meaning and value between peoples in different places or from different places. Um, and so by the 18th century, this was still being produced, but it wasn't as solid in certain ways as it became later in the 18th century and definitely in the 19th century. So mm -hmm. this inequality, this, this inequality, both in terms of like power and control, but also in terms of perception and ideas um, was was being produced at the time. Um, and then also, yeah, exactly. Uh, you were talking about sort of class inequality. Mm -hmm. And that was also in a way sort of taking away what I was talking about before with enclosure and the commons and taking away, you know, peasant autonomy um, was also something that produced inequality. And in ways, I wanted to mention, like the 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 thing that happened with with enclosure and the commons in England, isn't so different from what happened in Mexico after NAFTA. So actually, after and NAFTA was passed in 1994 in Mexico, mm -hmm. there was a, people owned the traditional forms of land ownership in Mexico allowed people and communities to own land together, and part of the NAFTA treaty was actually removed these forms of traditional land ownership. And it was part of what produced the huge migration wave that came after. So people are like uprooted, they can no longer subsist on their own. And then they notice inequality because there is, they, they can't feed themselves, you know, they can't live in a traditional kind of way. They mm -hmm. have to look for work, they have to like pay taxes, you know, uh, and, and then, you know, all the kind of social, political and historical things that happen as a result of that. If you've never read um, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, mm -hmm. that was eye-opening and enraging um, mm -hmm. to, to read what we did to Central America. Mm -hmm. um, and we kind of had a two-person book club leading up to this event of Civilized to Death by, by Christopher Ryan. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so much of what your um, book was about it, and what I liked in the description of civilization was in quotes, um, mm -hmm. the idea of civilization and how we define it, the um, Lord of the Flies kind of popped into my mind, um, but to a more real extent um, with, when I was reading your book, especially when they landed on the island mm -hmm. and, and there was a scene when they're in their early days of being pirates and they found the ship and they discovered that there were slaves on the ship. Mm -hmm. I loved the the line, I wish, I think I underlined it, but I, I won't try to find it, um, of we're bad people, but what <laughs> we have to decide what kind of bad people we want to be of. Like these people are technically property. We're pirates, we're supposed to go onto a ship and seize their property. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but do we do we want to continue the, this on? Um, I loved the 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 ideas that you were that you were exploring there. Mm -hmm. Thank it's so great um, that that sort of stuck with you in some kind of way. It reminds me of that scene, you know, that you bring it up, and um, yeah, that was something. I mean, that actually was historically accurate. Like there was mm -hmm. pirates were uh, multiracial kind of crews, and. In you know the, there was there's a great book called The Many Headed Hyd Hydra um, by Peter uh, Linebaugh and Marcus Redeker, um, and Marcus Redeker is a wonderful historian of 
uh, that period of time of, of maritime uh, uh, events that were happening and actually what he calls the revolutionary Atlantic. Because in fact, the, the Atlantic and the, and the sort of maritime world was like a cauldron of people sort of rubbing up against each other, being curious about each other, and also within this environment, this leveling environment of work. And the project of piracy, now not all pirates were, um, not all pirate ventures were, were multiracial, and not all pirates would have make it, made the decision that these pirates made, but many did, uh, mm -hmm. that were like, we're people, we're working together, if you'll take, if you'll join us as pirates, we're together, that's mm -hmm. it, you know, basically. Um, and so that's kind of what was, you know, that premise uh, is something that was, you know, sort of accurate and sort of going, going on at the time. But you also talked about like civilization, like you 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 opened the question with talking about civilization, this idea mm -hmm. of civilization, or what is it to be civilized? And I was thinking, and in reading that book um, that that you were talking about, tell me the title again: Civilization and uh, Civilized to Death: The C Price of Progress. Civilized to Death: The Price of Progress. So in the book, he really talks about like what he compares like earlier, you know, like hunter gatherer societies and kind of like the supposed advances of our current society. But I wanted to, so I read the book and I really liked it. And there's a lot mm -hmm. of great things in there. Um, and there was like a few things that other research that I've done, I wanted to challenge the idea of civilization, meaning that civilization is like this thing that we know now, you know, sets of laws, rules, et cetera, hierarchies, uh, you know, managers, captains of industry, et cetera, et cetera, and sort of um, introduce the idea that that there were other forms of, of people being civilized uh, well before, you know, uh, European sort of history sort of entered the picture. Um, mm -hmm. For a lot of like uh, indigenous folks in the Americas, they, managed land in North America, they managed, they managed this whole continent in terms of the ways that they managed land. They didn't have agriculture, they didn't till the soil, but they did burnings, they did all kinds of other practices to like manage the land, to support the growth of, uh, you know, prey species, bison, um, antelope, deers, etc. Uh, there's evidence that in in uh, the same thing was happening in Australia. The Australian Aboriginals were often called, you know, who are often seen as being this, uh, you know, very sort of, you know, prior to European colonization, this, you know, kind of very primitive, you know, human beings or whatever. Um, there's a great book called Dark Emu uh, by Bruce Pascoe, who's himself um, indigenous from a number of different um, tribes, who. Um, talks about the forms of land management that were going on in Australia prior to European colonization. Everything from rerouting rivers to encourage sort of uh, fish, uh, you know, uh, fish growing and fish cultivation um, to, you know, spreading seeds in certain plains of edible plants and all kinds of stuff. So there's different forms of civilization um, and, and different forms that are counter to this sort of European idea of civilization, which was like, we come in and we tell y'all what to do and we till the soil and, you know, we do it in this kind of way, et cetera. Um, there's another book that I want to mention, um, which I read recently, which is Barkskins uh, by uh, Annie Proulx, which is an amazing um, account of the, uh, of the timber industry in North America that follows these two families for like 400 years. Um, and kind of really captures the um, the the sort of colonial interest in um, in sort of getting what you can out of the soil and privatizing, you know, and sort of creating plots of land, burning down the trees, removing the trees, and sort of extracting things from the soil. And and it was like uh, people didn't see the colonials didn't they didn't see what was happening. Uh, they didn't mm -hmm. see the forms of life. And the ways that people were integrated into um, the land, and that the land sort of gave back to the people, and so so the ways that these kind of relationships were formed, and in ways you know um, we were blind to it. And there's all these you know missed opportunities in human development to kind of really have allowed um, these different forms of civilization to to flourish. And and maybe that's what that's what uh, that's what the characters in the book are doing. They're rejecting you know, form of civilization that was imposed on them and sort of figuring out how they want to be with each other. 
And I'm always fascinated by that idea that civilized to death was kind of the, the start of my, um, what am I going to call it? The little rabbit hole that I, that I went down. Um, it was one of the reasons that I was attracted to your book. We did an author event um, last month or two months ago with Sarah Berman, who wrote Don't Call It a Cult. Mm -hmm. And it was um, just the ideas of when you can start from scratch to start anew with the civilization, what decisions do you, do you si to decide to make? Mm -hmm. The parallel that I saw between the um, new Madagascar and like the hunter gatherers that Christopher Ryan really mm -hmm. um, admired was that they made a decision of, all right, we need to, and actually be, even before they were on the island when they were just pirates, mm -hmm. like, it, the civilization only worked if everything was equal and fair mm -hmm. and there wasn't this power structure that was introduced into it as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And and that's a, a new man. It's worth saying that New Madagascar was actually in certain ways modeled. So I placed New Madagascar, which is a, uh, you know, it's kind of like Madagascar. It's a dream of a dream, right? So mm -hmm. Madagascar was this um, pirate uh, haven that actually was the kind of late 17th century, uh, maybe early 18th century, where, um, you know, there was the pirates, there was a, they founded a pirate republic called Libertalia. Um, uh, and, so the characters in the book are sort of dreaming of, of this other place, this other place of sort of liberty and equality and, and freedom. And when they end up at a place that has that, that's what they call it. They call it New Madagascar. But it's actually modeled on um, certain communities that were in the Great Dismal Swamp in the Carolinas, between the Carolinas and Virginia. Um, there was a large maroon communities there, which were composed of maroons, um, uh, escaped uh, white indentured servants, remnants of the Tuscarora Indian Empire, or not empire, but the Tuscarora Indian peoples, you know, who were there, who kind mm -hmm. of were there and in formal and informal relationships with each other deep in the swamp, away from, you know, colonial power. And they figured out a way to be with each other for hundreds of years, actually, and um, spurred, you know, became a place of respite for people that, you know, wanted to, escape slavery and leave the plantations permanently or sometimes temporarily uh, and also a place for intrigue and um, conspiracy and uh, you know love and families and you know all those kinds of things so so yeah I sort of I knew about this community and I placed something similar with with different characters and a different history in a different place I imagined a different place but it, it was based on an actual community that's great we have a question from Laura um, she loved seeing the LGBT plus characters explored. Um, what was the process of writing characters like Jaleel in a time period that did not have the same gender and sexuality labels, identities we have now? Mm, I love that question. Thank you so much. Um, it, it is interesting. So readings of history tell us, you know, that uh, these experiences, so we are, a lot of times we're experiencing the gender stuff that is coming up these days around these, you know, sort of new identities or what people are understanding as new identities, trans identities, gender non-conforming identities in a way that seems new and a rupture from the past. Um, and in fact, um, reading history, you know, kind of closely and being curious about it, there's a lot of history of gender non-conforming characters in history. Um, including, you know, some who, who passed as opposite gender, both male, female and female to male. Um, and, you know, a lot of cultures that had um, all kinds of spaces within cultures for different forms of gender expression. I think I read recently, you know, Hebrew has, um, you know, like ancient texts of Hebrew have multiple words for different genders. Um, uh, you know, obviously, you know, different sort of native and indigenous societies, the Burdash tradition, two-spirit in, in indigenous societies, um, but also in contemporary or not contemporary, but, but modern kind of settings, there were all kinds of situations where people sort of passed. Um, and who was it? There was recently something with, um, there was a revolutionary, the, a Polish revolutionary war hero. It was either Pulaski or Kosciuszko. There was somebody who was a Polish Revolutionary War, American Revolutionary War hero, 
who they recently discovered was uh, intersex. Um, they sort of, um, he lived his life as a man, um, but they disinterred his body recently um, to, you know, do some research and they discovered that in fact he has this, uh, he, was a, he was an intersex person or a woman. Um, mm -hmm. And there's been all this stuff, like not to mention, there was recently in the last year or two, there was stuff around Vikings. There was recently some Viking um, warriors that they, uh, or they were examining Viking warriors who had been uh, discovered, you know, you know, in the last 20, 30 years, who they'd always assumed were men, but maybe with small statured men, you know, kind of, and mm -hmm. further examination has shown them that, that they were women warriors. Um, who you know were were warriors and and occupying that kind of space. So so I think that a, a closer and an open reading of history actually reveals that um, you know a lot of the, we're actually coming back to um, uh, ways of understanding gender and gender experiences um, uh, that were present in our societies uh, historically, but also in many other societies around the world. Um, so it was really fun to kind of explore those possibilities in the context of the book. That's a good segue. Um, before I get into this question, if anyone, we've got about 10 minutes left. If anyone has any questions, um, they're watching Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, you can use the comment feature and we'll see them on our end. Um, but how does historical reflection or how does historical fiction reflect our reality and what can we learn from it? Hmm. I like in ways like so as in approaching this, I was definitely conscious of that I was sort of writing about a time before our time. And mm -hmm. so thinking about the origins you know, of, of some of the arrangements and sort of ways that things are today. Um, but also thinking about maybe the ways that people thought about things at that time, which is like a different kind of um, uh, project, kind of like trying to get into other people's heads and how they were thinking about the world and understood the world in the time that they were in. Um, so that's one piece is like thinking into the past and thinking into the ways that people were and, and related to each other and lived. Um, and then how it relates to our time is definitely like that's what informs our time. That's those were the developments that sort of led to our time. I was trying to be careful about sort of projecting um, contemporary sort of ideas onto the past um, mm -hmm. in some kind of way. And I, I think I was relatively careful about that. I, I really tried to like stay within what was possible at that time, um, even with the fantastical kind of things, you know, based on based on actual, you know, kind of historical events. But, you know, history is, uh, history is present. It's like mm -hmm. DNA, you know, it, it's in the, it's in our, um, it's in our system in some kind of way. And so, you know, historical fiction allows us to kind of look closely and imagine ourselves into, you know, a time that, you know, informs the present. Um, and um, it's something that I've been thinking a lot about especially this past year of um, one thing that I kept just saying to myself and anyone who would listen is it frustrates me that we can't learn from the past, let alone the present. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, just looking at like the great influenza. Um, and one thing that was a revelation to me was a hundred years ago, everyone was wearing masks. Yep. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. and it's not a, not a new idea. Um, nope. So I think it's so important to and historical fiction, I think, kind of is an easier way to get into an idea rather than just a straight history book of diving into um, somebody's world and, and the time period. Yeah, I mean, it allows for some, it allows for um, speculation and that creative spark in terms mm -hmm. of like encountering the past, a little bit different than the dry delivery of facts, you know, in some mm -hmm. kind of way. And it's worth noting on your on, on on the anecdote about the the you know the great flu of 1918 yeah. Yeah. and and sort of mask wearing is that there was also I believe uh, an anti mask. Yep. Yeah, there was <laughs> at the time. You know, kind of. So so it's also you know the other part about looking at history is sometimes you're like, darn, it looks a lot like today. There's a lot of ways that it it, it doesn't look dissimilar from today. There was recently, maybe in the last six months, there was something, they unearthed a, um, a lunch counter. It was like kind of a, a buffet thing at, at Pompeii. 
uh, where people was like a street vending stand where people would come and get you know different kinds of dishes, and it totally looked like something you could see at a county fair today. Yeah. I mean, this is two thousand years ago. Um, that you know that these these for these certain kind of things like oh, people like to eat food in the street at places where they go for entertainment and mm -hmm. gosh this thing looks quite similar to something that they might have today like a corn dog stand at a county fair <laughs> we've come full circle to exactly. the <laughs> 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 uh, which one of our uh, viewers said that they've heard rumors that jamestown our area is going to get an ice cream truck all right so right. We are also coming full circle. <laughs> Excellent. The return of the ice cream truck. Very important. <laughs> We're very forward thinking here in uh, Western New York. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> um, do you have any other thoughts or anything that, um, any message that, that you wanted to end with? Um, I guess just thanks to you, Bob, for organizing this, um, for, uh, you know, asking these great questions and for, you know, hosting this stuff. I look forward to visiting your bookstore one day. Um, thanks to uh, Feliza and the folks at Lantern Fish uh, for their work, uh, you know, putting together this book and all the other books that they, you know, uh, promote and, and do a wonderful job editing and, and designing the covers for uh, and thanks to the audience for anybody who's tuned in and listening i hope this has been a good conversation for you um please you know check out the book if you feel curious uh definitely always looking for more readers um and you know if anybody has any questions or impressions i'm totally open to communication feel free to you know track down my email and shoot me an email uh and uh you know tell me what you think um so yeah, just thank you to everyone. A lot, a lot of gratitude and, and happy to be here this evening. Well, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for watching. Um, normally I end with the book is available in store. This is my copy. We're fortunately sold out of the book. Um, we have more copies on order, so we will soon have copies in store. Um, but there's a link um, in the description for the event, um, in the event information where you can purchase the book through our bookshop website. I encourage you to, to do that. We have two events coming up in June. Um, June 16th, we'll be talking to Andrew Schaefer, who has a book of, we'll call it poetry. Um, I think he's gonna be okay with the quotations around that. It's very similar to Jack Handy, um, Saturday Night Live. He is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Hope um, Never Dies. And it's the first of two Obama-Biden murder mysteries. They're hilarious. Um, that's June 16th. June 23rd, we'll have store favorite, Lisa Marie Redmond. Um, she's a retired cold case detective, and now she has um, four with a fifth book coming out in her cold case detective series. Um, thank you again for everyone watching, and have a great night.